Hello everybody, how are you going? This is Mohammed Amin. We are in Cairo now and we are in front of the Egyptian Museum. We have a tour inside this uh, the Egyptian Museum. I'll, I'm going to explain everything inside uh, this great uh, museum. The idea of Museum for Egyptian Antiquities in Egypt goes back to Muhammad Ali Baja, who was Viceroy of Egypt from 1805 to 1848, attempting to put an end to the export of antiquities. He issued a decree on the 5th of August 1835, which resulted in the first Egyptian Museum for Antiquities in Cairo housed in a building near El Azbakiya garden. The display was designed by Haki Khan Effendi and the collection was managed by Yusuf Dia Effendi. At the same time, Sheikh Rifai Tatawi, who was responsible for the excavation and conservation of Egyptian monuments, also Ordered that no further excavation be undertaken without his permission. He announced that the export of artifacts from Egypt was strictly forbidden and that all finds were to be transported to the El Isbekeya Museum. In 1851, during the reign of Abbas I, the entire collection was transferred from El Azbakiya to one of the holds within the, the citadel of Salah al Din, where it was accessible only to private visitors. However, in 1854, most of the objects were gifted to Asteria's heir to the throne, Archduke Maximilian, who had shown great interest in them during his visit to Egypt. They now re represented a major part of the Egyptian collection in Vienna Museum. The Rosita Stone, discovered by French soldiers during Napoleon's campaign in Egypt, was key to understanding Egyptian hieroglyphs. It contained a decree issued in Memphis in 1906 BC written in three scripts, Greek, Demotic, and hieroglyphs. Its current location in the British Museum. Champillion's knowledge of Coptic was crucial in his disenfranchised efforts. He realized that Coptic language still in use by Egyptian Christians was the direct descendant of the ancient Egyptian language. In 1822, Champollion made his priest through by comparing Greek text with the hieroglyphic and demotic inscriptions. Let's move together to another statue. Amenhotep, son of Habu, was a high official during the reign of the 18th dynasty, King Amenhotep III, about 1390-1352 BC. Greatly honored during his lifetime, he was revered by falling generation and worshipped as a god thousand years later in the Ptolemaic period. This statue was one of many commemorating Amenhotep's divine statues. It was installed in the temple at Karnak alongside other notable figures of the past, such as Imhotep, the architect of Egypt's first pyramid. Now everybody, let's move to the Narmer Palette, a sample of the unification. The Narmer Palette, also known as the Great Hier Hierakonopolis Palette or Narmer's Victory Palette, is one of the most significant artifacts from ancient Egypt. 
it dates back to around 3,100 BC and is attributed to the feral Narmer, who is believed to have unified over Lower Egypt. The palette is a key piece in understanding the early dynastic period of Egypt. The Narmer palette was discovered in 1898 by British archaeologist James Quebel and Frederick Green in the ancient city of Hierakonopolis, Nechen, which was the religious and political capital of Upper Egypt at the end of the pre-dynastic period. The palette is remarkably well preserved and provides rich visual and symbolic details. The Narmer palette is carved from single piece of cell stone. It stands approximately 64 centimeters, 25 inches tall, and is about 42 centimeters wide. The Narmer palette is richly decorated with intricate carvings on two sides, depicting scenes that symbolize the unification of Egypt's and Narmer's power. The Narmer palette represents the most important evidence that the first political unification in the history of mankind occurred in Egypt. The two faces of the artifact are topped by the name of Narmer, inscribed inside the sirich, or rectangular frame. The lower register or scene depicts two other northern enemies running away from the king inscribed upon their heads are hieroglyphic signs indicating their names or those of their localities. In the middle section there are two men holding two lines with extremely long necks representing the people of the north and south under the control of the king and his men. The lower section shows a pal representing the king attacking the walls of northern city. The upper section of the backside shows the king wearing the red t-shirt crown of Lower Egypt, followed by his sandals, barrier, and preceded by his vizier and four standard barriers. Next comes seen depicting the corpses of ten beheaded. The Egyptian Museum in Cairo houses several significant artifacts related to Sinusar III, showing, showcasing his achievements and artistic style of his reign. These pieces provide valuable insights into his rule and the Middle Kingdom period. Statues of Sinusar III Statues of Sinusar III are known for their realistic and expressive features. They often depict the pharaoh with serious, almost somber expression, reflecting the challenges of his reign and his rule as a powerful ruler. These statues are typically made of stone, such as granite, and sometimes features in Rikate carving and inscriptions. The statues exemplify the Middle Kingdom's artistic style and the emphasis on portraying the pharaohs as both a god and a human being. Mermaid head. This clay head is one of the earliest known representation of a human from ancient Egypt. Traces of color show that it was once painted. The holes on the chin and on the top of the head may have originally held her and her. The hole in the bottom properly attached the head to a piece of wood so that it could be used in rituals. 
The head comes from the mermaid Beni, Beni Salama, the earliest human settlement in Egypt. It's one of the few Neolithic sites known in the Egyptian Delta, dating to around 5,500 to 4,000 BC. As we conclude our tour today through the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, we have seen some of the most artifacts from ancient Egypt, from the enigmatic Rosita stone and the majestic Narmer palette, to the powerful legacy of Sinisar III. These treasures offer a glimpse into civilization that has fascinated the world for thousands of years. But the adventure doesn't stop here. Egypt is a land of unparalleled beauty and history, waiting to be explored. Imagine walking through the ancient temples of Luxor, crossing along the Nile, or standing in awe before the Great Pyramids of Giza. I invite you to come and discover the magic of Egypt for yourself. By the end of this part, we have already finished our today's uh, tour inside the Egyptian Museum. I hope to be at your good opinion. I hope to have a nice time. Goodbye. All my best regards for all of you. Have a nice time. Bye. If you enjoy this video, please give me it a thumbs up. Share it with fellow travelers and subscribe to my channel for more incredible tours and journeys. Your support and interaction will help me to bring more content to life. Stay tuned for the next part of our Egyptian adventure, where we will delve even deeper into these treasures lands if this video gets the interactions and views. Thank you for your watching. And I look forward to seeing you in the next part of our adventure. Until then, keep exploring and let the spirit of discovery guide you. Goodbye and see you soon in Egypt.